All right, welcome to the third and final video for chapter seven. Again, we're gonna be looking at what happens after glycolysis when we don't have oxygen. We're also gonna look at how proteins and lipids can be metabolized and enter different parts of the cellular respiration pathways. Finally, we'll look at how cellular respiration can be regulated. So what happens when we don't have oxygen? Remember that glycolysis did not need oxygen, right? It happens whether you have oxygen available or if you don't have oxygen available, it doesn't matter. But one of the reactants for glycolysis was NAD plus because you're going to reduce that and form NADH. When you have oxygen and you go through, remember that last step, oxidative phosphorylation when oxygen is present. When we went through that, we regenerated NAD plus when we were looking at that electron transport chain because NADH gave its electrons to the complexes within the electron transport chain, regenerating NAD plus so that glycolysis can continue. But what if you don't have oxygen? You still need to somehow regenerate NAD plus in order for glycolysis to happen. And so you can make some ATP through that process of substrate level phosphorylation. It turns out when you don't have oxygen, you go through a step known as fermentation. So glycolysis is first, and if you don't have oxygen, it's lacking, then the next step is fermentation instead of the oxidation of pyruvate. So through fermentation, you can regenerate NAD plus in an anaerobic environment. Anaerobic means you have no oxygen. There are two types of fermentation. One is called lactic acid fermentation. The other one is alcohol fermentation. One of these happens in humans as well. What do you guys think? So this happens a lot when we are working out and you're running low on oxygen, you start feeling tired, you wanna stop running, for example. Well, when I work out, I know it's not alcohol fermentation because this would mean as I work out, the harder and harder I work out, I'm gonna get like drunk from working out. So that's not gonna happen. In humans, when we rely on anaerobic processes to happen, because we don't have enough oxygen or running low, then we start going through lactic acid fermentation. So that happens in many cells, and we're gonna see other organisms like yeast can go through alcohol fermentation. So when and where does lactic acid fermentation take place? So I mentioned earlier, it happens in muscle cells when we're running out of oxygen. It happens in our red blood cells. Mature red blood cells actually don't have uh, organelles like mitochondria. So we're gonna have lactic acid fermentation happen instead of the processes like citric acid cycle, etc. It also happens in some bacteria like the ones that we find in our yogurt. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is known as lactate dehydrogenase and it catalyzes both the forward and reverse of this reaction, and this is gonna happen in the cytoplasm of the cell. So fermentation happens in the cytoplasm. That makes sense because glycolysis also happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. So let me look over here at this picture on the left. Remember glycolysis was when we take glucose and chop it in half to make two pyruvate, mole uh, two pyruvate molecules. Remember pyruvate is also known as pyruvic acid. And if I don't have oxygen, I need to regenerate my NAD plus because I used it, it's a reactant for glycolysis. So I go through lactic acid fermentation, which is the lower half of this diagram. So during lactic acid fermentation, I'm going to take pyruvate and convert it into lactic acid, also known as lactate. And that is a redox reaction, so it looks like I'm going to oxidize NADH forming NAD plus. So that is oxidized and this is reduced. All right, what about the other kind of fermentation? The other one is alcohol fermentation. It does not happen in humans, but it happens. The most common example are yeast species that are anaerobic. Remember fermentation is anaerobic and it involves two reactions. The first one is catalyzed by an enzyme called pyruvate decarboxylase, and I can see that is the first step over here. I'm gonna take pyruvic acid, also known as pyruvate, and I'm going to lose a carbon. So this is a three carbon molecule. 
and acetaldehyde is formed. Acetaldehyde has two carbons. And then acetaldehyde, along with NADH, we're going to convert that into ethanol and NAD plus through an enzyme or using an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. So my NAD plus can be reused again for glycolysis. And here our book gives us a picture of fermentation tanks. This is when they're uh, making wine. It looks like this process is for wine. When you ferment grape juice into wine, you produce carbon dioxide as a product. And these fermentation tanks have valves so that we can release um, CO2, the pressure from the carbon dioxide gas that's produced. If you're drinking champagne, they keep some of that CO2 in there to create those bubbles. And this is a nice summary of how fermentation works hand in hand with glycolysis. This is for lactic acid fermentation, but it could also be for, um, we could draw something similar for alcohol fermentation. So glycolysis, I'm generating pyruvate, and I remember I need NAD plus as a reactant. If I don't have oxygen, I go through fermentation, and you can either generate lactate like we have here, and those NAD plus that we can reuse for glycolysis, or this could be also substituted with the reaction we just saw with alcohol fermentation. We would still generate NAD plus so that we can continue to go through glycolysis. Glycolysis, remember, generates ATP. And in anaerobic organisms, they only generate ATP through glycolysis. This is through substrate level phosphorylation. So many years ago, when digital books started becoming big, um, my husband and I bought a bunch of digital books because they were like 10 for a dollar. And one of the books that we got was written by a doctor, a physician, who wrote a book about zombies and vampires, and he kind of like incorporated concepts from biology and medicine into the book, which I found kind of cool. So he kind of used this chapter, the material from this chapter in his book. And let me show you how it's related. So think about zombies. Zombies are slow, right? In the movie, zombies are slow and they're dead, right? So they're probably not breathing. Zombies are slow and probably produce ATP using, what do you guys think? Aerobic respiration or fermentation? Let's see. I just said that they're not breathing and they're really slow. So I don't think it's aerobic because otherwise they would make like 30-ish ATP per glucose and be faster. So I'm going to choose fermentation because they don't breathe and they're only making two ATP per glucose, which would explain why they're so slow. They can't really power anything. Vampires, on the other hand, are really fast and they drink blood. What's in blood? Lots of oxygen in the blood, right? So they're probably going through aerobic respiration because I know when you have oxygen, you can make around 30 to 36 ATP per glucose. So that could explain why they're so fast. So this is the idea that the doctor uses when he writes his book about zombies and vampires, and that was his explanation about why they're fast or slow, and that was kind of fun. And although we focus on glucose as the main reactant for glycolysis, what goes into the reaction for cellular respiration, we don't just eat glucose, right? We eat other types of carbohydrates like sucrose. Remember, sucrose is a disaccharide made up of glucose plus fructose. We eat lactose, which is glucose and galactose. Um, we, have, we eat starches, carbohydrates, glycogen is stored in our muscles. All of these different types of sugars, these carbohydrates, can be broken down or modified to enter glycolysis. And even proteins and lipids can be modified to enter glycolysis or different parts of the cellular respiration pathways. Because think about people, for example, who are on low carb diets or who don't even eat carbs at all. If you're only eating proteins and fats, how are you gonna go through this process and make ATP? It turns out that pretty much anything can be modified and shuttled into this pathway at some point. Amino acids can be modified and enter glycolysis. Glycerol, which is, remember, glycerol and three fatty acids create our triglycerides or lipids, can also enter glycolysis. 
Amino acids can enter the citric acid cycle or pyruvate oxidation, and fatty acids can also be metabolized and enter citric acid cycle. And it's not shown here, but even if we're desperate for energy, even our nucleic acids, remember our DNA and RNA, can be modified to enter different components of the citric acid cycle as well. Okay, so you do not have to memorize the scary picture, but the purpose or the point of this picture is to tell us that amino acids can enter the citric acid cycle. Remember, amino acids are the subunits of proteins. So if you're on a low carb diet and you're relying mainly on proteins for energy, then their proteins can be chopped up into their individual amino acids. And these are all the names of different types of amino acids. Remember, amino acids kind of look like this. Let me sketch it out really quick. Carboxyl group, our, pro our hydrogen atom, and then our side chain or R group. We have to get rid of the amino group, and that usually turns into ammonia and is eventually released from the body in the form of urea. Urea is excreted through the kidneys as urine. It also is released as sweat. The remaining portion can enter different parts or different stages of the citric acid cycle or even earlier. If we look at how cellular respiration can be regulated, it can be regulated by whether or not we allow glucose to enter the cell, and that's usually through hormones. I'll show you in the next slide. It can be regulated by enzyme reversibility. And if you have a reaction catalyzed by just one enzyme, usually the reaction is reversible and you can eventually reach equilibrium. Um, we can also look at enzyme or reaction that's irreversible. Reactions that are irreversible are usually reactions that are controlled by two different enzymes. One enzyme going in the forward direction of the pathway and then a different enzyme that catalyzes the reverse reaction. This allows a pathway to exceed equilibrium. Enzymes power these metabolic pathways so if I change the pH, um, for example, due to too much lactic acid being formed, I know that changes in pH can denature or change the shape of proteins. And most enzymes are proteins, so I can slow down or change the rate of enzyme activity by changing pH. And there are also additional feedback controls we'll learn later on in the course, as well as your second course in the series in 4B. So here's that example of the hormonal control of the levels of glucose. I need glucose for glucose catabolism to happen. And one way I can control this is through the hormone insulin. It turns out that after a meal, so you just ate a bunch of food, you have high blood sugar levels, high blood glucose levels, what happens is insulin is released by the pancreas. Insulin binds to a receptor on the cell, and that triggers a bunch of changes inside of the cell to allow GLUT4 receptors to be embedded into the membrane of the cell. And now that you have GLUT4 receptors, glucose, which is a polar molecule that cannot cross the cell membrane, can be shuttled into the cell. So if increase in cellular glucose, or the amount of glucose in the cytoplasm, means you can go through glycolysis at a faster rate. There are many other ways that we can control cellular respiration in terms of feedback, but you do not have to memorize this chart. Let me point out a few important trends. So one I mentioned earlier is glucose 6-phosphate. So glucose is phosphorylated right away in the first step of glycolysis through an enzyme called hexokinase. So remember, kinases phosphorylate things. They add phosphate groups. And the purpose of phosphorylating the glucose in the first step of glycolysis was to trap it inside of the cell. If you don't, it might just leak out of that GLUT4 receptor and then you run out of glucose and you can't go through glycolysis. Another way to regulate cellular respiration is by looking at how much of the reactants you have and how much of the product you have. If you have an increase in the number of reactants, such as ADP, every time you have an increase in the reactant, you're gonna have a greater rate of the pathway. Those reactions will happen at a faster rate. But anytime you have a greater amount of the products, like ATP, then that's going to result in a decrease in the rate in that pathway.
All right, and that takes us to the end of our third and final video for chapter seven. In our next chapter, chapter eight, we'll talk about photosynthesis.